start this episode with a crack of thunder. Yeah, I can hear it. Well, we have been on a roll with our guests and great interviews lately, haven't we, Steph? Yeah. I mean, it's just been one episode after another and pretty much some showstopper guests. But what makes today's show a little bit different is that, you know, we're taking it back to why Val and I podcast together. Because we started this show over two years ago because we like to grape gab and spend time together together getting our geek on, and most importantly, D-R-I-N-K together. So cheers to you, Val. Cheers to you, Steph. I could spell drink. Drink. I'm going to drink right now. Get my drink on. Mm. And so today Mm. we are going to have a grape gab about the grape Grenache because we're both drinking it and we've planned a whole show around Grenache or otherwise known as Garnacha. So Val, take it away. What are you drinking? Oh my gosh. I know I say that a lot on this show, but this wine is so dang delicious. And look how much is left in the bottle. Oh, not a lot. And look at the beautiful bottle. Ooh, and listen to the thunder rolling for you. I know, to the thunder roll with this cool little glass cork, this pink glass cork. Oh yeah, that's so fancy. Like, I'm so fancy. I know. (laughs) I know. I love that. I love that you're singing. But this is the 2015 Gerard Bertrand Cote de Rose, Languedoc, France. And this is a rosé. It's made with Grenache, Syrah, and Cinso. And it's probably one of the less than a handful of times in my life I've ever purchased a wine because of the bottle. Ah, the marketing got to you. The marketing got to me. This bottle is a work of art. But then I saw the producer on there in small letters. And I'm like, that's a trusted producer. I drink a lot of his wine. I am going to go ahead and purchase this gorgeous one. I got you one too. So it's here. And it's so elegant. I thought, oh, how good can the wine be? It's in this fancy schmancy rose rose uh shaped bottle. I mean, it's absolutely stunning. The color of the wine. It's this beautiful salmon color. But it is so good. John and I actually opened it last night. It's so floral. It's one of those, you know, jasmine, summer, you know, honeysuckle days, orange blossom happening in the glass. And then there's this ripe fruit, like kind of like wild strawberries and ripe raspberries and maybe a little blood orange, like Sicilian blood orange, bone dry. It's like you're in the med with this wine. And I can't stop drinking the wine. I definitely can't stop caressing this this gorgeous bottle. Mm-hmm. It's it's actually designed to be a work of art. I think they call it the art de vivre or, or the art of life. And this cute little pink glass cork. I'm like stupidly enamored. That you can enamored. reuse, right? Yeah, you can just plunk it back into the wine and uh, reuse it. So I'm just kind of like totally enamored with this whole bottle. I mean, everything. The, the whole, all the sensory experiences are covered in this sorry i'm fondling the bottle what do you got steph you're fondling it yeah no definitely a great gift especially if it's affordable too right so yes totally affordable i want to say it's it's under 19 dollars. yeah that's a nice that's a nice host host gift for sure totally i have a it's a little bit more expensive than yours about 24 dollars. this is the 2014 la fou cellar and the name that's that's the producer or the name of the winery and then um the name of the wine is els ameliers ameliers i don't know something like that it's a it's a garnacha blanca so this is from spain it's from the terra alta do and the reason why i picked this one is because i had it a few months ago it was it was really outshining all of the other wines that i had the fort collins wine fest and Adam at Supermarket Liquors uh, had a few bottles left on his shelf. So I snagged uh, almost all of them, I think. And La Fou is the name of the winery or the bodega, they would say in Spain. 
and is translated in Catalan to mean a narrow gorge where water passes. Okay, this is according to the winery's website. Mm-hmm. And, and the name of the wine, Els Amelers, refers to the almond trees uh, of that region that grow alongside the grapevines. And you totally okay. get these almond notes in the wine, too, which is really cool. And then Terra Alta... Um, is an area in the northwest of Spain. So that's in Catalonia. So that's where we're talking about where the wine comes from. And it is 100% Grenache Blanc or Garnacha Blanca, like they say there. And it's fermented and aged in six months in concrete egg vats and stainless steel tanks. And then 10% of the wine is aged in oak. So you do get some of that roundness. It's not overly oaky in any sort of a way. Um, but has a lot of pretty white flowers, um, some citrus notes, and some tree fruits. It's really um, a sophisticated wine, actually. Yeah. It's a, it sounds like a, one of those sexy, kind of complex, got a little bit of salty thing going on. Like, Oh, yeah. I heard somebody explain a white wine. It was a Chardonnay. And I want to say it was Sam Dugan of Sam Sands Dosage, whom I love. And I remember her describing a Chardonnay as like, you know, sex up against a bathroom wall. <laughs> In a gas, sta- in a filthy gas station oh, no. kind of way, but in a good way. Yeah. You know, in if there can be way. such a thing, yeah. you know, like in a sexy way, a lusty way, I guess. I have never been there, done that. But that's what you're, that six months in concrete egg, ten, stainless steel and 10% in oak, it does sound like a cerebral. Well, it's like somebody of. obviously really cares a lot about this wine, clearly. And they take all this extra effort to make something really outstanding. I mean, this would be really tough in a blind tasting. I mean, a lot of people would be like, yeah. what is this? You know? Yeah. What would you compare it to? So for those of us who don't see a lot of Grenache Blanc, I actually did have one in a blind tasting and I totally fell off. But <laughs> yeah, um, it's tough. Yeah. It's totally yeah. Tough. Yeah. I don't know what, uh, what there are some notes about it that make you think definitely old world. But because of the weight of it, uh, maybe it would be, maybe you would say, I don't know, it's some kind of Chardonnay or um, what else? Maybe like an Arnais. Oh, yeah. Something like that. I, I, it's tough to say. Um, it's, it's, it's its own animal. Like a Fiano. Maybe yeah. like a Fiano. Maybe a Fiano, yeah. So Fiano d'Avellino. Yeah. So, mm. but you know what is really funny about this whole Grenache thing is that what? that, well, I'll tell you what's funny, Val, <laughs> is I was searching, and I just want to make sure that you know our folks listening know this. But I mean, on our website, you can go into the search little box and put uh-huh. in whatever it is you think maybe we've talked about, because after a hundred and thirteen episodes. We have a lot of content. And so if you put in there Grenache, you find all of the episodes, all the episodes that we've talked about Grenache. And if you put in Garnacha, you also will see some more uh, things pop up. And so that's totally cool. But there was like 13 or so episodes that we've been drinking some sort of Grenache wine, Grenache blend most of the time. And... You totally had me beat, Val. I mean, like, hands down. I mean, I had only a few wines with Grenache in them. And you, quite often, drink. I mean, there was, like, 13 episodes that came up with this Grenache-based wines, and, and you had most of them. So you, you, you're you the winner. I think there were some repeats in there because I, I tend to – I really tend to gravitate toward the Southern Rhone crews and some of those other AOCs that aren't – cruise like I, i'm like i call myself a southern Rhone whore i think i said that in the wine store the other day and, and you know matt started laughing but that's what i like to stock my cellar with because one they're affordable okay yeah. and so a lot of grenache based wines it's not like this like filler grape i mean there's some really great chateau neuf de pops and so for somebody who can't afford to drink a chateau neuf de pop every single day i turn to the cruise like the lirac the rosto i've had a couple of them on the show got a new one this weekend uh, a vacura you know and i really like to having those wines on hand for table wines for barbecue what whatever so yeah so that's, uh, that's good probably for people to go hey yeah i can try that you know it's not yeah absolutely cost as much as a chateau du pop and then there's other people who are like i don't know what a chateau du pop is we might have to go over that a little bit more some other time but 
But yeah, but we got to talk about this grape because it is so versatile. Yes. There are different mutations of it. And you know, we're all about mutating on this show. Oh my gosh, we've talked about it several times. But we definitely want to dish out the down and dirty, not so much up against the wall in a dirty gas station. But <laughs> this is the wor- one of the world's most planted grapes. And, you know, we're going to lead with Grenache Noir or Grenache Tinta. Tinta. Uh, not to be confused with the Garnacha Tinto Rara that I was drinking a few weeks ago, also known as Alicante Boucher, that we talked about a few weeks back. So this is, uh, it's, it's actually Grenache. It's not a cross like the Alicante Boucher. And we all like to think of this black grape from the warmer growing areas of the world's wine regions. And as we mentioned earlier, it's definitely prolific in the south of France, you know, which is most of my cellar. If it's not Italian, chances are it's French. And it's the south of France, it's the bargain regions, you know, but not necessarily poor quality. It's often blended with Syrah and Morved or Cinso or Carignan, depending on where you go in France. But it's only been known as Grenache since the 1700s, Steph. And I was shocked to read that because Chateauneuf de Pop's been there for how long? Forever. You know, since the Pope moved his house there, I want to say in the 1400s or so. Chateauneuf du Pop, the Pope. But... Remember, and I might have the 1400s off, but I'm thinking that's when it was. But remember that Languedoc Roussillon, which was where Grenache was first to believe to show its gnarly vine head, <laughs> get it, in France, it's just up the coast from Spain. It's just up the coast from where your wine comes from in Catalonia. So you just drive on up north and you're in France. It's not too far from from there. And this is where many people believe that Grenache or Garnacha is, is originating from. However, if you read some history on why they can go back and forth and argue that this grape could come from the land of Cananao, where it's called in Sardinia off the coast of Italy, um, they believe that that could be the birthplace of Garnacha, and there are arguments for that. So you'd have to get in with the uh, arguments in uh, Wine Grapes, in Jancis's Wine Grapes book. But it's fascinating to watch the back and forth and like, well, it was mentioned in this literature here, but then there's no this type of Garnache uh, mutila- mutilation, <laughs> <laughs> mutation here. You know, it, it's really fascinating to see the ba- back and forth. But the bottom line is nobody knows for sure. You know what I always think about when I see Canon now is like a few years back, I think it was Oprah or Dr. Oz, somebody, it was probably Dr. Oz. The Cannonau and Sardinian grapes were highlighted in one of the shows, right? And it was supposed to be like the healthiest wine and why everybody lived there so long, lived to be so old is because they drank Sardinian Cannonau. And, and yes. so then it just started flying off the shelves, right? But that's what I always think about. But yeah, it's just Grenache, you know. So I remember that. He yeah. was on the Today Show, I think. I'm sure. I think it got so much press came over that, that a lot, even the liquor stores here in Fort Collins were selling out of all of their Sardinian red wine. Yeah, this was based on what they called the blue zone, where people live to be, to live a lot longer. And they think of a con- contributor I don't know how scientifically relevant, relevant. I haven't analyzed it, looked at the right. sources, whatever. John would probably roll his eyes if he does listen to this episode. But at the same time, th- because of the high level of phenolic compounds or resveratrol and whatever in the wine, in the skins, and we, we were mentioning earlier about the thickness of the skins, high concentration of phenolic compounds, that could have a lot to do with it. Again, scientists don't agree one way or the other there may be evidence pointing that way but you'd have to consume a lot of it so well, it's just goes... like nobody can agree on where did the uh, grape originate <laughs> exactly you have to go back but the etymology is fascinating and and that's one of those geeky things that you really gotta i'm sure most of you don't care so we'll move on we do know here's what we do know we know that this grape often falls into one of the top 10 grapes grown around the world in fact according to the university of adelaide research funded by the grape and wine research development corporation about two years ago it was number seven in the world and then according to jancis and wine grapes you know what i call my grape bible that is uh, i think number two in france behind merlot 
and that was a couple years ago when this book came out so things can change but uh, what else do we know Steph let's talk about what else we know about well Grenache. when I was when I was looking up some Grenache info uh, I came across something that I didn't know the strong wood canopy of Grenache is super helpful in the windy growing conditions okay I get that but I guess I just didn't really think beyond that that the strong wood canopy also makes it very difficult to harvest especially mm-hmm. with mechanical harvesters, you know. So that's something that really impacts the winery and and the cost, um, cost of the wines too. So, but this is why you often see it grown um, in low to the ground in the bush or goblet trained vines. So they're, they're not in the traditional trellis or anything like that. No, in fact, we were at um, Ken Forrester, in South Africa, and they had some goblet trained, low to the ground, bush style vines. They have to be harvested by hand. You cannot, you know, mechanize those. You go to Banyuls and you go to the one, gosh, there's that one place you can go and you can actually see a cross section of the ground of these Grenache old vines that plunge into the schist. Yeah. Like through the rock. I mean, how much respect do you have a vine that can push its way through the rock? Like, bitch it's like what you said earlier like gnarly <laughs> head like that really is you know it's a name of, it's a it's a wine label i mean there is a gnarly head wine but it makes sense yeah yeah absolutely that these vines are no joke stuff so what else do we know so they grow well where it's hot and dry yeah climate is an, a huge big deal for grenache and it also will continue to be a very favored grape because climate change continues to be an issue so there's yes. that. And Grenache, again, still on the Grenache Noir, they are medium high in alcohol, low in acidity, and express red and blackberry flavors. So yeah, you'll see a lot of descriptions, raspberries, strawberries, blackberries, things like that. And if you think about the wines, you know, from Priorat or Chateauneuf du Pop, they do bring some weighty, full-bodied, you know, that deep, intense complexity to the winemaking party, see? Mm -hmm. But also, they are high in sugar, so that's something they're very known for. Um, They also have that long ripening period in the sun, in the heat, and so they have a high sugar content that makes it great for other wine styles such as the Vindu Naturel, VDNs, or the fortified wines. I mean, you see those in, in France, even in Australia. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so Banyuls, that's seriously, like also, I know it is for you, Val, best wine ever yeah. for chocolate. And a lot of I, people totally. don't ever buy it or know about it. It's not served on a lot of wine lists, but um, pass, you know, skip over the port. Why don't you give Banyuls a, a try? Well, it's not a lot made and you don't see it. So when I find it in a store, I'm like scooping it up. I mean, well, I, I you, think they have it here at Supermarket Liquors every time I've gone to buy some for tasting because I want to yeah. show somebody something new and cool. Um, mm-hmm. So Banyuls, that's something cool uh, to try out and know that you're having mm. some Grenache. And then speaking of other wine styles, we shouldn't forget the rosé style, which is like what Val is having today. Um, And so some of the most popular ones that you'll see out there that are Grenache based are when you're thinking about Spain. So the Navarra region is very known for their rosés. And then in France, you know, the ever so popular uh, Tavel region makes Grenache based rosés. And what else? Well, typically we should note that although they are pink, salmon or cherry in color, they are normally bone dry, which... Val described hers as bone dry. I think it's it is challenging sometimes when you're talking to wine novices, and I hope I hope we have some novices listening. That when yeah. it's described as dry, we me- we mean that there's not um, residual sugar in in the wine, so that it's it's a sweet wine, but it can still have very pretty flavors and aromatics yeah. of sweet strawberries and sweet raspberries you know so it, the wine itself isn't sweet um and it's not it doesn't have the tannin like when you think of a dry wine so i think sometimes people get a little bit thrown off when we say bone dry mm-hmm. you know there's still going to be some nice 
richness in the wine and a, a huge impact of having this beautiful like fruit salad you know so yeah seafood olives a big bowl of mussels fries salty foods like they eat on the whole coast of france in the summer think about that and think about what a nice cool refreshing dry rosé does you know it's a funny thing when i when i do presentations a lot of times i would bring a uh, vouvray mm -hmm. from the loire valley and then I would bring like a Provençal rosé or even a Tavel, which are normally more cherry red in co color because the wines are made in a different rosé fashion, which is a story for another day. And a lot of people would point to the rosé and like, I'll try the sweet one. And usually a Vouvray, especially like a Demi-Sac, you know, is going to be sweeter. Yeah. And it's funny because people think because it's pink, it's sweet. And that's not the case. So a lot of great rosés are made with Grenache. They're dry, but they're still, it, it doesn't mean they're not delicious, loaded with fruit and flowers, elegance, and just so, so pretty and good all year round. Because a lot of people are like, oh, it's rosé season, it's summer. And that's normally when we're sipping a lot of it because it's available. But this is the quintessential Thanksgiving wine. I don't care. You could go rosé Grenache Blanc for the starter. You could do a nice rosé for the turkey. You could do a nice red Grenache and bring up Bagnoles because those are sweet for a dessert. You could have Grenache the whole way through Thanksgiving. I'm going to put that challenge on somebody. Somebody I should like have that. a Grenache Thanksgiving. I'll have a Grenache start with off with some, you know, Grenache Blanc and then have a Grenache Rosé and then have a couple of different styles of Grenache uh, Noir, right? And then Bagnoles yeah. at the end. That is That would be awesome. That sounds fun. Yeah. So yeah, there's the challenge on that. But you know, like we mentioned in Shades of Gris Grape Gab about Pinot a couple episodes ago, this grape, this Grenache grape, it does like to get its morph on. Mm -hmm. So there are other grapes and colors from which some of the world's most enjoyed wines are made to include what Steph's got in her glass right now, Grenache Blanc. So that or Garnacha Blanca. So that's the white version. There's the Grenache Gris or the, what the Spanish call the Garnacha Roja. And those two are actually both allowed in Chateau Neuf de Pop as well. In fact, there is a white Chateau Neuf de Pop also. Yes. But that's another, again, another story, another day. And then there's also another mutation called, I just learned about this one. I didn't realize the Ledener Palu or the Garnacha Paluta, the hairy Yes. The grape isn't hairy. I have, the leaves are hairy yeah. underneath. Yeah. The, the, the hairy garnacha. But, you know, I have to tell you something is yeah. that I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of a furry. I have, I'm like a furry blonde here. Okay. So I, I have like, you know, a little bit of arm hair on, on like, it's just a little white peach fuzz. But anyways, my <laughs> ex-boyfriend from forever and ever and ever ago was Hispanic and would call me mano peluda, meaning like hairy hand. Is that not hilarious? So every time I see that peluda, I'm like, God damn him, you know? <laughs> well, yeah, I'm like, well, that's not how you get on my good side, dude. No, I, mean, I know, really? I know, but I'm just like, you know what? I can wax that. So, you know, we're all good. Yeah. We're all good. Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. That's a great story, Steph. I love that. So, you know, if you guys are, if you're listening right now and you wonder about Ledin or Palu, that's what that means. That's the furry underside of the leaf they're talking about, not the grape itself. It's also called Grenache d'Afrique, which means like African Grenache, yeah. which I never heard before. That's cool. Uh, Grenache Poilu. Uh, Poilu is actually used to describe the soldiers back in World War One. I. I think we talked about that during... One episode, can't remember which, but Grenache Poilu. I never heard those terms before. So we actually all learned a little something today. I was like, huh, surprised to find that out. Yeah. So where else can we find old vine mutant ninja Grenache <laughs> growing in the world outside of Spain, France, and Sardinia? Steph. Oh, shoot. Well, I think I touched on it. Australia, um, you know, they're known for the GSMs, the Grenache Syrah Mouvedre, mm. Mouved blends as well and here in the usa so you'll mm -hmm. see some grenache um, in those wines a lot you know the popularity of red blends has exploded um i remember when i first started getting into wine i i really consumed quite a bit of australian reds and a lot of gsms Likewise. is where i kind of gravitated to and so i think it makes sense that people are uh getting into wine and having red blends 
Grenache is a great blending grape, you know, so that makes sense to me. And so we're also seeing good examples in South Africa, in Mendoza, Argentina, and uh, the Mall Valley in Chile. And mm-hmm. uh, is that Malle? Mall. It's Malle. Malle. Mall. Malle. Malle. And um, so, yeah, you'll see Grenache everywhere. I mean, we probably missed a few places that also grow it, but that's kind of where where you're going to see it most often and uh gosh that was like a ton of factoids right is there any more do we have another factoid we do have another factoid actually steph dug this one up which is so super cool because i was drinking tequila last episode and or the episode with joe fatterini right i was drinking the uh cody and tequila is lovely but we've also together been to some classes with arthur black on mezcal which are fantastic and we had the pechuga and (laughs) you'll definitely have to look up pechuga because that's pretty funny but tequila is actually a subtype of mezcal tequila is made specifically from the blue agave plant and can only be made in five specific delimited areas of mexico including the entire state of jalisco and then the others are municipalities but mezcal is kind of the overarching category okay so tequila is a subcategory subtype of mezcal if you will mezcal can be arranged from a different array of agaves from all over mexico so it's not a specific but it's kind of all the rage and new mezcal bars or mezcalerias mm-hmm. are opening all over the United States. And the sad part is that there's not enough mezcal to keep up with the demand because the agave plants take seven to 10 years to mature and harvest. Right. So okay? it's not like a grape that just grows every no. year. No. And in fact, even grapes, they take, what, three years before you can have your first vintage. And it's usually about seven years before you get the vintages you want. You know, you get that complexity from the grape. So we're going to link up an article in the New York Times that addresses a mezcal's uh, popularity and sustainability. And if you see it in the store, definitely pick it up. I mean, you make cocktails with it, just like uh, like tequila. But I remember the, the first time I sat in a mezcal seminar with Arthur Black at Society Wine Educator. We need to get him on the show. That dude's a trip. Yeah, that would be entertaining for sure. Oh my God. We need to like get him on this show because when he tells you the, the story about the rabbits and, and like what 400 breasts and the rabbits and it's all like Mexican uh, lore yeah. and uh, Katie Coatle and the whole story. And when he tells you about the tequila or I'm sorry, the, the pachuga and we're, we're all tasting the pachuga, which is distilled with a chicken breast. And somebody in the seminar said, why the chicken breast? And he goes, who cares? It's a chicken. <laughs> That's a great answer. It's mezcal distilled with a chicken. Yeah, well, here's, and, here's the take home message, guys. Don't pass sorry, up. I got to Don't pass. No, this is, this is Val, exactly what I'm going to drive home for you. Do not pass up an opportunity to taste mezcal uh, or have any kind of mezcal tequila taste off to see the differences because it's really kind of a cool thing which is why it's so popular right now and it's a great substitute in cocktails even if you can substitute it for whiskey or you know scotch or something in a cocktail and it's just it's cool and um it's fun it's got great stories behind it like the the pachuga and the chicken you know i mean so so it brings a whole nother dimension to uh a margarita or a cocktail with those kind of stories but i think yeah it's definitely got a more smoky peppery thing going on because of the way it's made it's made just a little different from tequila the production's a little different. So I actually mistook a, a tequila for a mezcal or the other way around on a blind tasting because ah. I was looking for that smoke and I'm like, oh, it's so smoky. It's got to be mezcal. It's, it's so peppery. And it was ended up being tequila. But, Darn. you know, it goes to show you it's just as good. And I think a lot of people don't don't look for it. So thanks for putting that on our radar because that brings us to Wino Radar. Wino Radar. Well, so because we're in Colorado and we love living here, we just don't want to live anywhere else really. 
Not when you can travel to other places and then always come back to Colorado. I wanted to highlight the 2017 Colorado Wine Governor's Cup competition that's coming up in July. Um, So July is when the judging happens, and that's going to be a panel of psalms, chefs, writers, and wine experts from all over the country. Why have they not called us? I don't know, but that is, you know, that can be changed at some point. And then the winners, so whoever wins the Governor's Cup, there's going to be a a tasting event and a revealing that's open to the public August 3rd in Denver. We do have all of the links. And the reason why I'm telling everybody, even though this is an international show, is because Colorado – makes quite a bit of wine and it's on the map now and there's going to be like 250 wines from 35 local wineries uh, involved in this competition and the link is going to show you who's won in previous years and so if you have any interest in tasting some Colorado wines check out who's been the winners and especially who have been the winners consistently year after year And then you Mm -hmm. will start to get an idea of which wines you should try or maybe order online and which websites are worth, you know, checking out a little bit more to see what's going on in Colorado and our wine region here. Where is it in Denver, Steph? I think it's at the, um, it's downtown. Oh, what's it called? I've been there. History. It's the Denver History, um... But it's no, really it's cool, pretty. but don't don't they know who we are? I know. Seriously, this has to change. It's called Colorado uh, History Colorado Center. It's it's a weird name. It's called History Colorado Center. Huh. It's on Broadway. Okay. Twelve hundred Broadway Street. Thank you. I mean, I leave the next day for Oregon, but sweet. How about right. shout outs? I know. Shout out to everyone who sat in on the certification summit in Austrian wines. I think the taste along is certainly a way to go. Some of our listeners were in there as well. I saw Meg. I saw Andrew pop in. I didn't see any comments in the comment block, but I know Meg was up there in there in the beginning. I don't know who else uh, who was in there who listens to the show, but if you do, that's so cool. Thank you for coming. We went three and a half hours, but I wish they had these when we were studying for our CWE because well, yeah. it is so cool to be able to go in depth into the wine laws. We talked about the PGI apricots of Austria. There's an apricot brandy that they make. It's a PGI, uh, Protected Geographical Indication. And there is a liqueur that we got to get our hands on that's made with these apricots. And I didn't know about this. And so there are a lot of things that you learn if you're studying for the spirits exam or specialist of wine certifications or even the CWE that I wish I wish we had more of these. And these are fantastic benefits to being yeah, a member. Any, at any, anything you're studying, those uh, webinars and summits are, are super helpful. I mean, I actually now am kind of ob- obsessed with Mallorca and Menorca since I did that Spain summit. Yeah. Because Jane talked about the PGI cheese. Yep. And anyhow, and the gin. And I was just kind of like, I think I need to go there. Maybe I'll go in the next couple of years because I am obsessed since that summit. (laughs) It's been on my bucket list for a long time. And I was actually trying to get us there in January to meet up with Martin in Mallorca. Well, Martin, if you're listening, we still want to get you on the show. But I was actually looking at flights out of London to Mallorca and then flying back. I was actually trying to get us there because it's been on my bucket list for some time. When I lived in England, that's where a lot of the Brits go. They go to Mallorca, the Canary Islands, and and Menorca, and all those places. And there's some very unique wines from there as well. So that's probably a, an area that we definitely want to cover when we can finally get a, a sliver of Martin's time. But um, what about your shout outs? Oh, wait, one more shout out. Andrew. 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 He's one of our patrons, and you might remember him from the episode 111, our millennial moment, and we definitely want to have him back on the show. I think that episode was a lot of fun. Really, yes. I really liked what he brought to the to the table. 
I would like to have him be our like token millennial, maybe. So if you guys got millennial issues, you want Andrew to talk about Andrew. We're, <laughs> we're just going to pimp him out. He doesn't even know. It's like, hey, Andrew, why don't you come back on the show and answer millennials questions for us? Uh, but he sent us some May wine. And you remember us talking about that. So thank you for sending that. I think mine has a, I don't know where you guys got this, but the, the little price tag says something like sausages something sausages i don't know where the you hell have to you... take a picture take and a you picture. need to I don't put it in this buy your wine, dude, blog. but either way that was so sweet and unexpected and thank you for sending that and uh it, and that's all for my shout outs what about you stuff well you know because i did go to new orleans not too long ago i have to give a special shout out to the server we had at pesh her name is heather and I do have a link to the restaurant because it was one of the top two places we ate. And I had been there once before when we were there for Society of Wine Educators. Mm -hmm. It's so good. You have to keep going back. And it's kind of like that show in, in Las Vegas, Absinthe. Hmm? Every time you go to Vegas, what? you have to go back and go to the show, Absinthe. I never heard about so... it. Is it about the booze? No, oh. it's not. Okay. But it's a variety show that is so hilarious. And anybody who's listening and is nodding their head going, how many times have you seen it? Seriously. I mean, I, I anyway. So Pesh is like that. You have to keep going back because it's so good. But Heather knew her stuff, gave us the best experience. We were laughing constantly. We were like best friends by the end of the whole dinner. She, We were like, we want to hang out with you. And uh, anyhow, what was so exciting and so geeky was that, of course, at the end of the night when the dessert menu comes around and everybody's looking at each other, I saw the Digestif Underberg and I had never had it before. So, of course, I'm just like, it was inexpensive. And I was just like, what is this, you know? And she's kind of like, oh, it's, you know, this herbal digestif you know whatever it's german and i'm like yeah bring that bring that up you know so oh my gosh you guys and there's this whole presentation that goes with it because it has its own glass it's this tall little underberg glass that was created like for like the paris fair in the 1800s and it's sorry i'm on the website and the music just came up you guys want to oh hear God. it Yo, I saw the, the video and everything, and it's so corny, and it's so awesome at the same time. Uh -huh. But so, so it's this family secret. So if you want to know what's in Underberg, I cannot tell you, okay? Because it's a secret and dates back to like 1846. And all we know is it's a composition of herbs from 43 different countries, but it is delicious and so fabulous like I need to order a case and it's these tiny teeny weeny little bottles that are like 20 mils it's like medicine what? and so you you serve it in this little tall glass that is an underberg glass and so yeah it was hand blown and designed like originally created just for underberg and it tastes like Christmas and it's so awesome so Val, you're going to love what this. What a cool experience, Steph. Oh, my gosh. And so sorry. if you, Did you hear the, the singing when I clicked I clicked on the website? No, I couldn't hear it. I couldn't hear it. Oh, probably because it. it was in my headphones and yeah, I've had two glasses of wine. So <laughs> that's a great experience. Oh, my gosh. I cannot wait to try that. How have I not have it? No, they say Underberg, not Underberg. Oh, it's probably it's, Underberg. doesn't have the umlauts. Yeah. I don't know. But, no, um, I don't think it has the umlauts. Okay. But I'm going to go with Underberg. Well, let's go with it. That's Could great. be Underberg. But yeah, so it's German. It's great. It's And it's not like, um, what am I trying to think? What's that black, uh, not Goldschlager. What's the? Uh, 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 Jägermeister. Jägermeister. It's nothing like that. Nothing. So don't get, uh, you know, I'm not into that. Don't, don't say that. Because this needs, this tastes like Christmas. So it's so cool. So yeah, maybe I will find some Underberg, Underberg, and and we'll do a swap. You've got the rosé for me. Uh -huh. I will get some Underberg for you. We need to get a date together. Oh, my god! I don't know why don't, we don't have that on the calendar. But let's, besides saying how much we love each other and all of our drinks, we love our Patreons. We do. We love our Patreons, guys. Thank you so much for supporting the show. And we are sending out some serious Patreon love this week. We have our Tenacious Tasters, Jeff E. from We Like Drinking. And in case you missed it, they were talking about the Kalichimoto last week. Oh, 
Oh, did they really? Yeah, one of their patrons wanted Jeff Jeff Solomon to try it. You know, he's anti soda, anti sugar, so that was pretty funny. So it was funny that we did just he like happen- it. Did uh, he try no, it? he didn't try it yet. So it was one of those things where their patrons get to play bartender. So you have to listen to that episode about the uh, 16th green. Pretty funny. Was it the 16th green one or is it one before that? I can't remember. Anyway. Go listen to We Like Drinking. They're hilarious, and they support the show. Hilarious. Lynn from Savor the Harvest. You know, I'll bet she's one of the very few out there that's probably tried the lead in her pelu. And we thank you for supporting the show as well. And Sassy Italy Tours. I saw a notification that that uh, Sebastian Sassy was playing in the group today. I didn't see what the post was, but... Oh, he's posting all these beautiful photos. Oh. Oh, yeah. He's traveling, drinking, eating, doing some great stuff. So that's really fun to look at. Because, yeah, he's posting it on our Facebook private group, the Wine25 community. So that's... That's cool. So go interact with Sassy Italy Tours, Sebastian and his lovely wife, Brooke, I'm sure. Uh, they're hanging out in there. And our It's Not 5 O'Clock and We Don't Care listeners all over. Megan, she's up in South Dakota. Clay's out in Arizona. John and Aswani are out in California. And Andrew is in Illinois. And guys, if you want to jump on the Patreon bandwagon and you like what you hear, you like spending time with our Wine to Five community, then it's kind of like buying us a glass of wine. You know, just go out, click the $1, $2 level or whatever. Or, you know, just jump up to the $10 level. Get your, is it $10 for the t-shirt or 20 No, it's $20 for the t-shirt. But I don't think everybody realizes this is once you pay your $20 and it gets run on your credit card, you can continue on for as long as you want, for as little as time as you want, and you can cancel. So you can still get all of the goodies and you don't have to go on for Patreon, you know, for months or years at a time. So. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So we definitely, you know, we, we encourage to downgrade your membership. But once once you get all the goods you want at the $2 Tastemaker listener level or higher, you still get entered into all the really cool drawing Drawings. gifts. And we do yeah. we do have some cool ones that might be coming up soon. So definitely check out our Patreon page. We love you. But we just love you for listening also. And if you can't. Uh, you can't support Patreon. We do have a store. So yes. thank you guys. I wanted to thank you guys who've been shopping in our store lately because we made a whole $13 last month in our store. So yay. Yeah, see, because this is what's neat. I don't think everybody realizes all the different ways they can contribute and help us grow our show and support our weekly content that Val and I spend so much time doing this. And I think that, you know, now you know. Patreon is one way. Buying stuff in our store helps support our show as well. But most of all, we we thank you so much just for listening, but we double thank you if you hit subscribe and become a regular listener and share it so that people know. So share it on your Facebook, share it on Twitter, tell everybody you're listening to Wine to 5 and why they should listen too. We also want to encourage you to leave us a speak pipe message. How about, since today we talked about Grenache, you could leave a speak pipe comment and say either what your favorite style of Grenache is or ask us a question about Grenache that we didn't address and we would be so happy to bring that up in a future episode. So then you would get to hear your voice on our show. So uh, what else can we say? Oh, we talked about the store and Facebook, Twitter. Did we mention we're on Pinterest and YouTube? And actually, my nail tech today told me that she was uh, listening on YouTube to Andrea Rogers' episode with us, and she thought it was so fun. And so, yeah, you can go to YouTube and check it out and you can share it from there as well. We're also on Google Plus. Val is on Twitter at Wine Gal Unboxed and as Vina with Val on Facebook, Instagram and Pinterest. And I am on Twitter, Instagram and Pinterest as the Wine Heroine. And you can also find me on Facebook, too. So until next week, that was a that was a great grape. Gab. It was. And I'm smiling like a big old dork. I actually took a picture of it because I'm looking at your face, but there's a little box in the bottom of the Skype corner where I can see my mug. And I'm like all teeth because <laughs> I'm so happy to be doing this with you here today, Steph. So what a great, <sighs> great fun episode. And until next week, everybody. Cheers. <laughs> cheers.
<laughs> I think I smiled through that entire episode. That was so much fun. Oh my gosh. Well, it is why we do it.